Welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we're happy you could join us for another hour of good gardening. Our phone volunteers are back this week, so if you have a question for us, you can just dial 1-800-676-5446. Emails and pictures for future shows can be sent to byf at unl.edu. Please give us as much information as you can about that question, including where you live. Keep in mind that due to the number of questions we're getting each week, which is great, we can't possibly get to everybody's question on the air. You can search our YouTube channel for past features and programs, and while you're there, you can hit subscribe so you can also enjoy all our new content. So, Kate, you get to start off the show with samples. Yes, so today I brought with me some bagworms, and bagworms are really timely right now because based on degree days here in eastern Nebraska, they're expected to hatch this week. So they can feed on over 120 different types of plants, um, but mostly we see a lot of the damage on evergreens, conifers, things like that. So on Tuesday, my son picked these bags for me and I was, thought they'd be perfect for backyard farmer. And then today I noticed, hey, there's tiny little caterpillars everywhere. So they're hatching right now. Mm -hmm. um, so if you do have a conifer or an evergreen and you've had you know, previous Bag, bagworms in the previous years or have damage, um, go out there right now and pull off as many of these old bags as you can. They have a really unique life cycle. The female will spend her whole life in this bag and then she will lay up to a thousand eggs per that little shelter. So from one of these, there can be a thousand eggs. So pull off as many as you can. Um, and then the next couple of weeks, just spend kind of scouting to see if you can find little caterpillars. Watch for damage because when they're small, they're a little easier to manage. You can use a product like um, BT or Spinosad. That's, they work really well for the small caterpillars. And then if you kind of drag your feet a little bit um, and the caterpillars get big, you're noticing a lot more damage kind of in July. And then you can use like pyrethroid products or Carborel. All right. Thank you, Kate. All right, Matt, one of our favorite weeds. Yes, it's a uh, purslane. So I got a baby purslane and then like a juvenile purslane. But if you give it like two more weeks, it's gonna be a full grown adult and it's gonna be set in seed. So if you had any of this last year, each plant probably <coughs> put out thousands and thousands of seeds. You're gonna start seeing it on the ground. And generally it kind of looks purple when it's coming out of the ground. It is a summer annual. So now is the time soil temps are in the 60s. So it's starting to sprout. Um, and if you control it when it's little, it's a lot easier than when it gets to even this size. So be scouting out there and make sure that you get it before it's too late. Uh, products containing carfentrazone, uh, any of that active ingredient works really well at burning these back. Uh, Roundup alone doesn't work great. Uh, so if you're doing a new seedling or a new seeding, which is probably about the cutoff date for any spring seedings, Tenacity is a great product uh, as a pre over new seedlings that prevents this weed from happening. Or it gets it when it's young, but not when it's this big. Um, so, or let it grow and you can eat it. <laughs> Thank you, Tastes Matt. like spinach. <laughs> All right, Kyle, another piece of beauty. Yeah, well, it, it may have been at some point, but this, <laughs> so this was, it, this was a geranium that looked very pretty um, about, uh, about two and a half, three weeks ago. And then slowly the leaves started to drop and the, um, and the flowers wilted. And we got this black discoloration that moved all the way up the all the way up the stems from the soil line. It almost looks like it has black legs. And what is, what's the name of that? Because pathologists are bad namers. This is black leg of geranium. And so it's actually caused by um, a few different species of, of of pythium. Pythium is one of our uh, one of our water molds, and so not it's not not a true fungus, which can make it a little bit more difficult to control as well. And one of the things about Pythium is it tends to, tends to infect roots between the, kind of in the outer, the outer layer. And so you can strip off that outer layer of root pretty easily, which will lead to some of this rat tailing that, that you may see, that you may also see. Unfortunately, not a whole lot of control for, not a whole lot of control for this. It is favored by moist conditions. And so anyone who had some geraniums in the ground and then they got water, saw, um, water loaded over the past, what was that, two weeks ago, a week ago, when we just had rain upon rain upon rain, these, the Pythium um, oomycete loves those conditions. And so we may be seeing more of this, but again, not a whole lot to do about it. 
Um, really, just it's a, it's a removal uh, a removal situation. All right, thank you, Kyle. Sarah, it looks like you were hungry. <laughs> Something was hungry. <laughs> Um, so if you got your, your vegetables in the garden early this season, you may have some things that are almost getting ready to harvest. So obviously this is a little radish and there has been something that's been eating on it. Um, and so this is slug damage. Um, and you can see they've, they've chewed some different holes in this. Let me turn it around so you can see the other side. They've chewed it on that side too. So slugs are one of the common uh, uh, pests that we would see of some of the root crops like this. Other critters that could cause root damage to uh, a crop like radish would be some of the root worms, which, but those would be more little, um, little shot holes that would tunnel inside the radish, and then you would probably get some brown rot uh, around the shot holes. So controlling slugs, um, you could use diatomaceous earth. You could scatter that around the um, base of your plants, and as the slugs call, crawl through it, that'll scratch up their body, and they will dehydrate and die. So that would be one good way to control them. You could also use... Um, Row cover fabrics, but you'd want to put that on before the slug started to feed on your radishes. All right, thanks, Sarah. All right, Kate, you get the first round of picture questions. Uh, the first one, you have two pictures. Uh, we had a million of these. Uh, she says, worms and little black things are falling from the tree. This is in Douglas County. Um, so there's the worms, there's the little black things on that particular plant. What is it? And there is an ash. So 2022, <laughs> year of the sawfly, lots of sawfly questions. Um, so this is the brown-headed ash sawfly. And so the sawflies are stingless wasps, but their larvae look like little green caterpillars, as you can see in this picture. And luckily, um, they feed on the ash tree leaves, but most of the damage is just going to be cosmetic. As long as the tree is healthy, you know, it's not going to um, harm the tree that much. Um, can't help that they're raining down on you. That's probably a good thing. You know, they don't have food anymore, so they're not going to be feeding, and maybe next year's generation will be less. But um, not really much to do at this point. It is seasonal, and so kind of just deal with raining caterpillars for the moment. <laughs> well, and your, your last picture here is one who had the larva, but also had something on his yellow submarine rose. And so there are the ash worms. And mm -hmm. then what happened on that yellow submarine rose for your fourth picture? Oh, yeah. So once again, this is likely also sawflies. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this is called the rose slug sawfly. And once again, it's a stingless wasp. The caterpillars are chewing the leaves. Um, and once again, damage is mostly going to be cosmetic. I understand <laughs> if you can leave it, leave it. But I understand people don't want the holes in their roses. I get that. So if you can pick off as many caterpillars as you can, you can do that. Otherwise, you can do use products like insecticidal soaps, something containing bifenthrin or carbaryl. All right. Thank you, Kate. All right, Matt, you have two pictures for your first one. This is brown patches and weeds in formerly lush grass. This is in Lincoln. Uh, and she says one of these patches is full of violet. She does know how to take care of her turf, but she wonders what happens here. Uh, yeah, that is a tough situation. I have the same thing in my yard, and there's two big trees that uh, prevented it from growing. And the winter was really tough on it because the trees sucked a lot of that moisture away. So I think coming out of winter, we lost a lot of grass. It looks like it's mostly bluegrass, so it will eventually fill in. Um, fertilizer, you might have to do some seeding. If you can, introduce some new varieties that do a little bit better in the shade. And with those weeds, if you're going to seed, I would go with some products that are safe on new seedlings. All right, and you have two pictures for your next one too, and this is an Omaha viewer. Uh, this shows where the pines were, and then we have uh, what has happened. He's been trying to get turf to grow there. He put topsoil over it. He raked in a Kentucky blue and a ryegrass mix, but it doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, it, yeah, I think you probably did everything right, but there's always that issue of what's underneath what you put on there. So there's that root system or the, the stump that's still there, and that's what's going to keep that ground kind of hydrophobic. It's going to suck that moisture down. So what we're probably seeing is a hydrophobic soil with uh, limited moisture. So if you're going to reseed, make sure you keep that area a little bit well watered rest of the, compared to the rest of the lawn, and that should help with uh, getting those areas established. All right, thanks, Matt. You ha your first picture is from Burwell. Kyle, this is a peony, just one. She did put preen around the plants. Um, no 2,4-D's been used. Does this look 
like it is preen related or is there a disease going on? And then you have another one of peonies coming up here. Yeah, uh, it, unfortunately, just based off of the picture, not, it's really difficult to come up with a, with a definite conclusion. Um, unlikely, it's, it's unlikely due to the preen. I would wonder about some sort of soil, um, some sort of root health issue. Um, potentially there is some Phytophthora or one of those other root rots that is, um, that is affecting that plant. Uh, decreasing the plant's ability to absorb water, and that's why we're seeing those leaves curl the way that they are. But from what we have, um, I would need more information. All right, and then your next one is a viewer who, who has had both Botrytis and Phytophthora. He used Maneb. He's wondering whether he should prune those plants out or back, and if so, how much? Is he ever going to get rid of it in this planting? This is in Battle Creek. Yeah, so unfortunately, anytime we have some one of those soil-borne fungi, it's, it will stay in the soil forever, for the most part. Um, and Phytophthora is certainly one of those, one of those cases. Um, Maneb, uh, Mancozeb work, it is effective at controlling Phytophthora on peonies, as long as the roots aren't already rotted. If we have rot in the roots, there's really nothing that can be done, and so you probably want to start thinking about um, moving those peonies to a different location. As far as pruning goes, um, you can prune them back. You'd want to prune them back to what, about the second leaf, um, second leaf from the soil line, um, not all the way back, um, not all the way down to the dirt, but pruning would, would also help. All right, and then you have two pictures here from Ewing, which is rhubarb, or was. Yes, well, it was probably picked in a, in a pie at this point. Um, but this is Ramularia uh, leaf spot of rhubarb. Rhubarb tends to get two major, two major fungal leaf spots. One is Ramularia, the other is Ascochyta. Ramularia, though, has these those reddish halos around them. And you know, typically, it's nothing that we need to that we really need to worry about. Um, we tend not to eat the eat the foliage of rhubarbs. Um, and it does not affect the does not affect the stem, and so we can just get rid of those leaves. The best thing to do, though, is going to be to increase um, increase airflow through the canopy, and so maybe space the rhubarb out a little bit if you can. Then also make sure that you are doing some good sanitation at the end of the season as well. Again, this fungus will overwinter in the in the debris um, from last year, so making sure you're getting rid of the debris from last year will decrease inoculum for the up, up, upcoming year. Great, thanks, Kyle. Sarah, you have one peony question. Uh, this one is lots of foliage, not many flowers, and she's wondering about thinning the peony itself. So peonies don't need to be divided very often, but if, I mean, if the plant has been there for 10 or 15 years and it's never been divided, then maybe, maybe you do need to dig it up and divide it. A couple of other things that could potentially cause a low number of flowers would be if you're fertilizing too much, too much nitrogen can, can promote a lot of leaf growth, but not much flower development. The other thing would be anything that would stress the plant out and would reduce its vigor. So if you cut the foliage off too early in the growing season or you're, um, uh, you didn't water enough in the fall and the plant was very drought stressed going into the winter, those things could have caused a decrease in plant vigor, which would result in fewer flowers. So um, see if any of those make sense with what you have going on with that plant. All right, and then you have two pictures for the next one. This is an Elkhorn viewer. It's a bee balm or a Monarda. Three plants three weeks ago. They're getting these blackish dry leaves. Full sun west side of the house. He's wondering uh, what's the deal here. Yeah, I think you just have a little bit of transplant, transplant stress going on here. So the plants may have gotten a little too dry. Uh, after you first put them in the ground and so you're seeing some scorching around the leaves. So just make sure that they're staying, you know, pr well watered. I mean, not <clears throat> constantly soaked, but make sure that they have plenty of moisture. It looks like the new foliage is coming out strong and the plant is doing well. So I wouldn't have too serious of concerns about this plant. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Well, we are already seeing our fair share of aphids around campus and out in our garden. Small populations of aphids aren't really much of a problem, but for our first feature tonight, Kate says when there are a lot of them, that's when the problems start. There are many different types of insects that we can find in our garden. Some are large, like the beautiful monarch butterfly, while others are small, like soft-bodied aphids. And while aphids are small, they make up for their size in sheer numbers that can be found on a single plant. There are many different species of aphids that come in a variety of colors and sizes. Some are generalists, 
like the green peach aphid, which can feed on hundreds of different types of plants. And others are more specialists, like the bright yellow oleander aphid, which feeds on only a few plants, including milkweed. And then others, like these found on the golden alexander, are black in color. Aphids can be identified by the presence of cornicles or tiny little tailpipes sticking out of their back end. And most aphids that you see are going to be wingless, although some mature aphids can have wings as well. And the reason why aphids are so important in our garden and landscape is because they feed on plants. And unlike caterpillars, which chew plants and cause defoliation, aphids have a straw-like piercing sucking mouth part and they feed on plant sap. And because aphids reproduce so quickly, sometimes it seems like hundreds of aphids show up overnight, quickly overwhelming our plants. And that's why it's really important to inspect our plants for aphids. So you can check the underside of leaves, that's where most aphids are found, particularly on newer growth. And plants that are being damaged by aphids will start to have their leaves yellow and curl, and some plants will even die. Other signs of aphids include their white exoskeleton that they shed as they molt and grow, as well as the presence of shiny, sticky honeydew on the plant leaf surfaces. And sometimes with honeydew comes the growth of sooty mold, which further restricts the plant's ability to photosynthesize. And to add insult to injury, some aphids can also transmit plant diseases and viruses. And while all of that sounds terrible, in most cases, aphids are not a serious concern. They have a lot of beneficial natural enemies like lady beetles, lacewings, and parasitoid wasps. And sometimes when those natural enemies are not quite enough, a strong stream of water from the hose will knock aphids off and is a good option for non-chemical management. In some cases, if it gets pretty bad, you can also apply insecticidal soaps or horticultural oils to plants as well. However, just remember that aphids are small, they're good hiders, and they have multiple generations throughout the growing season. So remember to keep checking and monitoring your plants for these tiny little sap suckers. So here's one pest that can be controlled with just a spray of water instead of some pesticide. Do keep a sharp eye out on the undersides of those plant leaves. All right, you get the next round of questions. Kate, your first one here is uh, a client who's curious about these worms. What are they and why would they, they be in this hackberry wood? This is in Hebron, cutting up the tree for firewood. The third, this picture is the underside of the worms. So. So I'm going to preface this by saying that I really like things with six or more legs. <laughs> that being said, um, so most, wor most worms that we encounter, they're going to be like decomposers. So they might have just been at the soil surface if you found them on the outside of the tree and the tree was laying down or, you know, it looks like there's a lot of moss on there. So maybe they're eating that. As to what worm it could be, possibly earthworms. There is um, the Asian jumping worm, but I don't know if it's been confirmed where you're at. So I wouldn't be too concerned about that. I think they're just probably having a snack on that moss. All right. Your next picture is uh, hydrangeas, and it's actually no hydrangea, but he was pruning some dead limbs out of it. It's limelight, hydrangea, and he found some holes, and then he found this little guy. He wonders what it is, and does he need to treat his remaining hydrangeas? Yeah, so this is really cool because it is a small carpenter bee. Usually when we talk about carpenter bees here, we think of those really large ones that look like bumblebees that, you know, bore in and make tunnels in our fences, our decks, our siding. But this is a small one and they don't, they don't bore into wood. Instead, they go into the, um, the stems of weeds or hydrangeas in this case. And because these bees are important pollinators, they're not going to be, they don't cause a lot of damage to the hydrangea. Um, I read if you deadheaded the hydrangea maybe last year, that kind of created an opening for the bee to go into. Um, but otherwise it's not gonna affect the health of the plant and it's just a lovely little bee. All right, thanks. So actually this, this gardener is creating good habitat yeah. for some pollinators. Yes. So you should pat himself on the back. There you go, <laughs> perfect. 
All right, you have three pictures on this first one, Matt. Uh, this is a North Platte viewers. They had uh, a tree taken out, brought in some fill dirt, and this came with it. So that was a winter picture, the roots, and then the rhizomes. Uh, they tilled and they think they made it worse. What is it? Yeah, if it's, I, I'm pretty sure by looking at the pictures that it's, it's like a common Bermuda grass. And that's not very common for the area, but it does survive here in Nebraska. Uh, and it can be a very aggressive spreader. And now is when you're gonna start seeing those new shoots and it'll start crawling along the ground with its stolons and setting roots and it'll spread very rapidly. So if you tilled it, you probably spread it around and it's gonna be growing pretty, pretty well because if, if you detach it, it'll just shoot new roots. Uh, so if you wanna try and get control of this, uh, glyphosate is an okay option, but it doesn't really do a great job. Uh, another option would be to use um, Flazifop, which is Weed Be Gone. I think Ortho Weed Be Gone is the product. Those two, combination of that and glyphosate, uh, works a lot better at controlling this. Uh, but if you do get it controlled, there's probably a 30 day seeding window if you use that active ingredient with, with glyphosate. But, All yeah. right, and your next two pictures are also North Platte, thick clumpy bladed grass and we had multiple pictures of this again. Yep, so. thick clumpy grass is generally a tall fescue and this would probably be one of the common K31 which is an old variety and if you only have one it's going to just keep growing and growing because uh, it's kind of a tillering plant and it'll just create a clump and they are difficult to control even with uh, glyphosate so just spot treating that area um, and you're going to have to probably do it multiple times to actually kill that plant. All right, thanks, Matt. Your first two pictures, uh, Kyle, are leaf discoloration on this catalpa. They're concerned about the tree. What diseases do we see? So I think that this is anthracnose. Um, anthracnose affects most, pretty much every shade tree that's out there. Um, it's, often we get some black lesions that are associated with the veins. As those lesions mature, they may drop out, hence the holes that we see in some of these leaves as well. One of the nice things, though, is anthracnose rarely causes long-term damage to, to, um, to, to mature trees. Um, there may be some early defoliation, which maybe if, if there's a lot of defoliation, you may want to consider a fertilizer, um, even though we typically don't recommend fertilizing um, mature trees. But that would be an option, but really nothing to be too concerned about. You may see a little bit more as the season continues but the tree will be fine in the long run. All right, and then you have two pictures, one from the eastern side of the state and the other from the panhandle of this beauty. The beautiful orange globs. Um, so this is a cedar apple rust gall. Uh, it's the, well, and then this is a cedar kintz rust gall. Um, both are, are, are gymnosporangium <laughs> rusts, and so they overwinter on cedars, on junipers, and then they, in the spring, the, these orange globs will, are full of spores and those spores will blow onto our rosacea as hosts, whether it's a kintz, whether it's a, your apple, whether it's your pear. Um, now is that if you are, we don't really need to be concerned about damage to our, to our junipers um, due, to this, due, due to this fungus, but if you are wanting to control this on your, um, on your rosacea trees at home, now is the time to be applying that fungicide. Um, something like Captan does tend to work. Copper is also, an, um, is also effective. All right, excellent. Okay, Sarah, your first two pictures are a winged duonimus or a burning bush in Lincoln. Five years old or more, it's always done well, but this year the leaves are all curled and I think we have a picture maybe of, of the base of this plant. They wanna know whether they should take it out or wait a, f wait a f while. So I saw a lot of this type of damage last year coming out of uh, the winter, and it was more environmental than a herbicide drift. It was more of a, a, a freeze damage image that, or damage type that killed some of the bark, the cambium on some of the stems. And the shrubs that I watched last summer didn't ever really grow out of this. They, they stayed like this all summer long. Um, you can give this plant some time and see how it does. I'm, I'm suspecting maybe there was some root death over the winter, maybe due to dry conditions or some other type of environmental effect, but I don't think the plant will grow out of it very well. Um, of course, if you want to bring us a sample, be very happy to look at it and see if, you know, maybe it's something like herbicide damage, which a plant can grow out of, you know, once the herbicide is broken down. So 
be happy to look at a sample if they want to bring it. All right, and your final picture for this round is a lilac, cupped, wrinkled leaves. The big one on the other side of the yard is starting to get it also, and a burning bush. Same thing or something um, different? I don't have not really seen these, this type of cupping on lilac due to environmental issues too much. This could be some herbicide damage. Um, but again, this is a situation where it would probably be great to see a sample so we could really look for those small signs that would give us an indication of herbicide versus environment. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, our backyard farmer garden is up and running and already putting on a show. We're also excited to get our supplemental garden going with a brand new retaining wall. Here's Terry to tell us what's happening in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're looking over our garden and watching how our transplants are really making their way in their new homes. They're starting to really take root and start growing, and we're excited to see what different colors and textures we put together this year. We're also finishing up our raised bed wall. We're going to get that irrigation in and get that planted with all of our vegetables. So we'll have tomatoes, peppers, green beans, okra, all those good garden vegetables in there for us to grow, try and donate to the local food bank. We're also making sure that everything is well watered and everything will get mulched to help preserve that water and add organic matter back into our soil. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. It is really amazing how that space has developed into something great over the years. So uh, we are going to go to another round of pictures now. And Kate, you get the first ones. This is uh, two pictures, and it's a bur oak tree, approximately 10 years old, um, grew from an acorn, but now it's curled leaves and lumps on the underside. So um, what do we think this might be? So I suspect that this might be the early stages of oak apple galls. Um, and they're really small in this picture, but these galls tend to be on like the mid rib of the leaf or near the petioles. And they actually get pretty big. I would say about the size of a ping pong ball. So you're catching it early on, but um, what happens is a cynipid wasp will lay its egg on the oak leaf and the plant pretty much overreacts to the egg. And it forms this ball around the egg and it'll hatch and the wasp larva will feed and then it'll emerge. Um, and once again, it's something that's purely cosmetic. It's not gonna really threaten the health of the tree. That being said, you know, as the years go by and you noticed that it's getting worse and worse. You can try to like prune out as many of those galls as you can before the adult wasps emerge. All right, and then your next picture is actually from Scott's Bluff. Uh, this one is the oak, I think, still, mm -hmm. but uh, then we have one that is um, from Scott's Bluff that is spiny rose gall. Yeah, I kind of love how these look. <laughs> yeah, so spiny rose gall, um, same thing. It's a different type of cynipid wasp, but but they, um, they lay their eggs on the rose and they form these really beautiful spiky balls. And um, yeah, so same exact thing. It's purely cosmetic. If it was me, I'd be like, hey, that's cool, I leave it. But if you don't <laughs> like it, once again, you can always prune them out too. All right, thanks, Kate. All right, Matt, your first uh, picture is, uh, this is a Fremont viewer, and he says he keeps finding this leafy tap-rooted plant in his garden. Has no idea what it is, but it is very hard to kill. He thinks it's buckwheat. I, uh, looking at this one, just by the picture, it looks like horseradish, and it looks like a tasty weed to me, because I <laughs> love horseradish. So one way to find out would be basically to maybe look it up and ID it a little bit better, looking at some horseradish plants, but by the taproot and the way that it's sprouting out new, uh, new shoots, usually if you try and chop it off, it'll spread out like that. So horseradish, grind it up and put some vinegar in it and you got good horseradish for the sandwiches. <laughs> and you have three pictures for this next one. This is an Underwood, Iowa viewer. Has this growing in the yard and garden and cannot seem to get rid of it. What is it? So uh, we've got this and then I think a close up. Yeah, I've never really seen this weed either. I had to look for a while trying to figure out what it is. Uh, orange hawkweed is the closest thing I came to uh, mm -hmm. by the pictures. Uh, it is a perennial and it shoots up like an orange flower and that produces a lot of seed. So if you wanna get rid of these, 
Um, make sure that you don't let them go to seed. Uh, and they do spread by their roots, short roots, if that's what this weed is. Uh, so they will continue to grow throughout the, plant, or throughout the lawn. Uh, so 2,4-D and dicamba are the two best uh, active ingredients that work on this plant. Um, and that would be one way to control them. All right, and let, us, uh, let it bloom so we can... Yeah, I mean, it would be a little bit yeah. better uh, ID if we could see it a little older. All right. Kyle, uh, your first picture, you have actually a couple of tomato pictures here. The first one is, is this curly leaf virus or bad dirt? It's a jet star tomato. Yeah. Pull it or start over? Um, I would really want to see more of the plant. And so if it, if it is viral, if it is a virus, typically the viruses are going to show up on the newer growth first. Um, and so I'd be curious what the rest of that plant looks like. If it's all, all has the curly leaves, you know, it's probably, Now's a good time to replant tomatoes, so maybe kind of cut your losses and get another one. All right, and your next two pictures are a papillion uh, viewer. What's wrong with her tomato? She is used to drift from the farm fields, but she's got this weird demarcation on the stem. Yeah, so the um, this one actually looks a little bit more like a virus issue to me, um, where we do see the, the new growth, and it looks like a lot of the new growth is, is affected. Again, we would want to see um, will it grow out of it and so maybe wait a little bit and see if the next leaves that are put out if they're still curly as well as far as the uh, the discoloration on the stem th this it could be a few things um, I wonder if it's just due to some um, wounding due to transplanting because if you look closely there are some adventitious roots that are coming out of that tissue as well so it's still healthy tissue for the most part um, but I would be more concerned about the the curly leaves to see whether or not there is a virus issue going on. All right, and then you have one more. This is a Gordon, uh, Nebraska viewer over by Shadron. Blue spruce a couple weeks ago dying at the top. What do we tell him to do? Um, it's most likely winter injury, um, or there could be a canker up there, most likely a canker that's favored by winter injured, um, by winter injury as well. Not a whole lot to do. You can kind of top that spruce if you want. Maybe you can have a nice blue spruce lollipop growing, <laughs> but unfortunately the top of that tree is dead. All right, thank you, Kyle. Sarah, this uh, first one here is a, a Lincoln viewer who is wanting our opinion on uh, watering this very shady perennial mixed garden. They've used soaker hoses, but unfortunately didn't get them down in time. Are we going to suggest soakers or some other alternative for this kind of a space? Well, circle hoses would be preferred because you, anytime you can keep the foliage dry when you're watering, it, it's the better method because you have less uh, chance of disease injury. Um, so you could put soaker hoses in here if you can weave them in and around the plants. Um, I think part of the question was also whether or not they could, it, they could connect multiple soaker hoses together, mm -hmm. which you, you could if you have the water pressure to do that and you still get some output at the end of the, end of the line, wherever that may happen to be. Um, otherwise, if you're not watering too often, it maybe this garden only needs watering once a week or something like that, or maybe it doesn't even need watering at all right now in, or until we get into the drier weather of you know, July and August. Um, if that's the case and you're not watering very frequently, then you could do overhead irrigation, um, but it's, 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 less, it's less conservative of water. Um, so anytime you can do drip or soaker hoses, it's better and you're conserving water more effectively. All right, Sarah, and then you have two pictures for this next one. Um, this is a 30-year-old, probably a PJM rhododendron. Appears healthy. They want it to be shorter, and they're wondering whether they can and should prune it, and if so, how and when. So from the, the problem that I see in this picture is that they don't have a lot of uh, shoots on the interior of the shrub to cut it back to. You can cut rhododendrons back pretty hard, but um, ideally, you want to cut back to a shoot or a bud um, and not just make random cuts that will generate a lot of um, adventitious growth or sucker, sucker development where you make the cuts. Um, so I guess what I might suggest would be that you, you, you take out a few of the heaviest, thickest stems this year to try to open it up and allow more light to get into the center of the shrub. That will help it start to develop more secondary branching down in the middle which will then in subsequent years give you the opportunity to make more cuts and bring the height down so that eventually you can get it to the place that you want. Now, rhododendrons can tolerate some pretty hard pruning most of the time. Um, if you wanted to cut it back really hard, you, you could try it. 
we can't guarantee that the plant will survive if you do. All right, thank you, Sarah. You right now, it is time for lightning. Sarah, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, your sample was appropriate because your first question from a viewer is the radishes are all tops and no root. Why? Uh, too close spacing, too much nitrogen, not enough sun. Those would be my first thoughts. All right, this is a Council Bluffs viewer who said his mulch turned into a solid mat. How do you stop that from happening? Um, try, try to put lighter layers on at one time, and then you may periodically need to go out and just rough it up with a rake, and that can help prevent that matting. All right, this is a Hastings viewer who wants to know whether it is okay to use fresh grass clippings to mulch tomatoes. Yes, as long as there haven't not been any herbicides applied to the lawn. All right, your next one is a Utica viewer who put down weed and feed five weeks ago. Is it okay to use these clippings on the garden? Um, it depends on what the herbicide was in the product that you use. So a weed and feed could be a, a fertilizer plus pre-emergent or it could be a fertilizer plus a post-emergent. If it was a post-emergent, I would say definitely no. All right, so since we are almost out of time, you did a nice job on that. There goes lightning. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Kyle, ready? Of course. We had two viewers uh, send us pictures of penstemon that had red rots and spots and dots on the foliage. What is that and should it be treated? That is penstemon rust, nothing to worry about. It'll, it'll go away before too long. All right, this is a Clarkson viewer who wore leather gloves while um, she was removing trees that had fire blight and canker. Does she need to sanitize those leather gloves? Uh, probably not the worst idea in the world to, to spray them down with ethanol or something like that, but it, sh they shouldn't harbor, uh, should, should not harbor the pathogen though. All right, this is a Cass County viewer who has a very old ash that has lots of shelf fungi. Is it dying? Yes. <laughs> we have another viewer who has a crab apple and one whole side of the crab apple, the foliage turned yellow. Is this a disease and will it recover? Uh, possibly. Um, I would be curious if there's some sort of canker maybe on that side. It's restricting, restricting nutrient flow. All right. This is an Omaha viewer who wonders how you get rid of mushrooms in a sunny yard. Uh, don't. They're, they're, <coughs> they're going to be fine. The only thing that we, you can do to get rid of mushrooms is going to be to get rid of the, the, the woody material that they are feeding on that is 8 to 10 feet down in the soil profile. All right. Thank you, Kyle. All right, Matt, ready? All right, let's do it. This is an Ashland viewer who wonders why there are so many dandelions this year. I think it was the winter. The open winter caused more germination. All right. Um, you mentioned, or somebody did on a previous show, how to control crabgrass and foxtail in the small stage. What was the, what, how, how did you do that? Um, there's a couple products. Uh, Mesotrione works on small crabgrass, and then there's a newer product called Pylex that works really well on, cra on foxtail and crabgrass. All right, this is an Arcadia viewer who wonders uh, how to control the bindweed that invaded his iris bed. Hmm. I don't know. That one's probably going to have to be pulled because you don't want to be using herbicides next to the irises. All right. Uh, a no mow may viewer uh, didn't mow and then mowed it really short and now it looks like there's dead places in the grass. Will it recover? Uh, eventually it probably will, but it's probably going to be patchy and you're going to have to reseed if you're not going to mow. All right. Is there a safe spot treatment for broadleaf weeds right now? Um, safe spot treatment. There's a lot of uh, ready to use products that are sold at a lot of the stores that are usually not very volatile. You stay away from the 2,4-D and dicamba if you can. There's other ones out there. All right. Ready, Kate? Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is an Albion viewer. They have garden flocks and they already have flocks plant bug again. Should they just give up on the flocks instead of trying to kill the bugs? Most important thing is fall cleanup. They live in the dead stems of the flocks, so clean it up. All right. Um, we have a viewer in Lincoln who says there are tiny, tiny red insects crawling on the deck and people, etc. What are they and do they bite? Um, those are probably concrete mites or clover mites and no, they don't bite. All right. Uh, we have a Lincoln viewer who treated their lawn with grub X, but they want to know how to treat for the grubs in the garden. Um, if they're in the garden, they're not probably going to be too much of a concern. I don't think so. 
All right, a Fairberry viewer wants to know about a garden spray for the tiny little seed ticks. Um, so I don't recommend spraying turf. You can spray like the edging, like near bushes and stuff, but look for something with bifenthrin in it. All right, uh, this is an Omaha viewer who wants to know how to get the carpenter ants to move along. They destroyed his deck and he's wondering about a flamethrower. Um, hire a professional. <laughs> All right, excellent. Matt, you won that one. Yes. All right, Sarah, Plants of the Week. <laughs> um, so we have a couple of different um, pretty types of penstemon here. This is a cultivar called Dark Towers. And then this is a cultivar, um, we're thinking that it might be uh, Warax, which is one of the shell leaf penstemons. So penstemons are obviously coming into bloom right now and uh, great <coughs> perennials to have in the garden. Um, they like full sun and are, are fairly easy to grow. The other uh, perennial we have here is um, Zizia aurea, or Golden Alexander, and it's in, the, um, it's in the carrot family, which you might be able to tell by the shape of the flowers. Um, it uh, gets to be about, oh, between one and three feet tall. It likes moist uh, oh, prairie areas, and it will also do really well in a rain garden. So if you've got kind of a wetter spot in uh, a perennial garden where you'd want to add something with some nice yellow color, then Golden Alexander would be a great one to add. It's also a larval source uh, for black swallowtail butterflies, so a good one if you want to get some butterflies in your garden. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Well, we goofed earlier in the script because Rock has already showed you those grassy weeds. So instead, Chrissy Land from the Nebraska Forest Service is going to show us some freeze-damaged trees from out west and talk about whether or not they'll survive. Here in the Panhandle of Nebraska, just recently, we had a pretty significant freeze. We are seeing a lot of the young new growth on our trees starting to shrivel up and turn brown, crispy, and then eventually drop off of our trees. We had a record of 16 degrees in Alliance, Nebraska, and here in Scotts Bluff, we had a couple of nights in the 20s, the mid 20s. Um, when we have warmer weather in early April, it's going to encourage our trees to break bud and push those leaves out. And we end up having that young tissue that hasn't had enough time to harden off. The nice thing about the way our trees grow is that they don't push every single leaf bud at the same time. So luckily for us, we probably still have some leaf buds on those trees that were impacted by the freeze that we can end up expecting to push behind all of those damaged tissues. We're definitely seeing some of this damage happen on young trees and old trees. Um, we are probably likely going to expect to see all of that damaged foliage, like I said, crisp up and it will eventually drop, but pushing behind it, we will see some young new growth. We definitely wanna make sure we keep watering our trees, get some good mulch on them and try to create the best living environment as possible for these trees. So after a late season freeze, a late spring freeze like this, um, we can expect our trees, any of the leaves that were damaged, they are going to start to shrivel up and likely fall off on their own. You can go out and check your trees. They might look like they have completely dropped everything. They might look a little dead, but just give them some time. Make sure that you keep watering them. Give your trees plenty of mulch to keep that root environment, um, plenty of moisture in it and keep it ideal for root growth and just give your trees some time. The concern we might have is when they begin to push that next flush of buds, if we end up with a lot of really high heat here coming this uh, first couple weeks of June, then we might see uh, some burning of that young tissue. And so not only do we have freeze, but we can also have burning, especially where we're here in the Western Panhandle of Nebraska and are very exposed and have been through a drought for quite a while now. So with these trees, it's sort of just a wait and see uh, sort of deal. You want to give the tree some time to bounce back from that loss of foliage. They're gonna drop those leaves. And the most important thing is that you make sure that they keep getting some water and that their roots are in an environment that they want to keep growing. 
Some plants will make it out okay, others won't. It's that waiting game and you'll have to be patient to see if your plants will survive. All right, Kate, we have a minute and a half. Uh, you have two pictures on this one, little mounds on the ground in the entire backyard with a little bitty hole in them. Uh, the top of the mound crumbles when they break it. What in the world might this be? So two things come to mind. One, it's either white grubs that have matured and they're leaving the lawn or two, and this is one I lean more towards, it could be sod webworm. So I would take a tablespoon of dish soap, put it in a gallon of water, pour it in some area and see if you get some caterpillar activity. Um, or just keep an eye out for moths that kind of zigzag and fly around the turf really close. Sounds interesting. And then your uh, next picture is these critters are in the compost pile. Are they, what are they and are they harmful anywhere else? Yeah, so these are white grubs. I suspect because they're in compost, they're probably the green June beetle, but I'd have to see them to be sure. And yes, white grubs can be pests of turf, but unless you're seeing actual damage or have a history of it, you don't need to treat. All right, and you have one final picture, which is from Norfolk, and she wants to know what these little beauties, and you can see it on that bridal respirea. Yes. What is that? I love this. It is an eight-spotted forester moth and their caterpillars feed on plants in the grape family. So, a good guy. A good guy, yes. The adult moth is obviously a pollinator, so let's keep him around. All right.